Chapter 7 of Days with Great Poets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Days with Great Poets by May Clarissa Gillington Byron. Chapter 7 A Day with Rossetti. A hot July day of 1871. The Chelsea streets refracted the scorching sunlight with that peculiar sultriness common to low-lying districts. The river flowed with a metallic glitter, and no cool breath was wafted from its long, sleek ripples to temper or invigorate the sweltering air. The leaves of the London plane trees, dulled with dust, endured the heat with a perceptible effort for it was now between ten and eleven a m and the sun stood high in heaven but in that solid roomy old-fashioned dwelling number sixteen cheney walk with its look of equal nobility and shabbiness known as tudor house from the tradition that it had been a nursery house for Henry VIII's children, there was no suggestion of the solstice. Its beautiful lime trees, yellow with honeyed blossom, threw depths of shade across the grassy garden. Its windows were dark with midsummer foliage. It was as deeply secluded as the heart of a wood from the torrid splendor of the heat and not unreminiscent of some strange and tropic wood in the number and variety of its outdoor inhabitants. A gorgeous peacock trailed his tail along the path. A deer's antlers jutted between the lower boughs of the trees. An armadillo here and a kangaroo there. A wombat, a wallaby, a chameleon. Owls of every sort and size parakeets, jackdaws, and a raven disported themselves in this paradise of the grotesque. And as for rabbits, hedgehogs, dormice, squirrels, and other ordinary British animals, only to mention a few, they were so numerous as to defy description. Never did a more heterogeneous collection of fauna exist, outside the zoological gardens, than the extraordinary menage which inhabited the spacious garden grounds of sixteen Cheney Walk. Meanwhile, the master of these furred and feathered folk was languidly rising and dressing. The whole aspect of his apartment was dark, almost forbidding. Thick, dark velvet curtains covered the windows, heavy hangings were round the bed and on the walls. An enormous mantelpiece of carved dark oak took up nearly one side of the room from floor to ceiling. Old black picture panels enhanced the general effect. One would hardly have believed in the blaze of sunshine without or in the magnificent color sense of the man who deliberately surrounded himself with such a funereal weight of shadow. Yet Rossetti, at this period of his life, was at his best of health, of prosperity, and with what went with him for happiness. He was free to follow his bent in all respects, to indulge any whim, whether within or without the house. If caprice kept him up at night until three o'clock and later, if insomnia or indolence prevented him rising till towards noon, as now, if he chose to fill the house with rare china and the garden with rampant animals, there was none to say him nay. Autocratic by nature and habit, he was at present autocratic by dint of circumstance and in every respect his own master and a law unto himself dante gabriel rossetti was now a man of forty-three rather short distinctly stout 
good-looking in a sense, but not impressively so. His large gray eyes, his dark brown hair, his dark auburn beard and mustache conveyed but little intimation of his Italian origin. Still less did his badly molded mouth indicate the typical artist. He wore spectacles for his failing sight, which were not conducive to a picturesque appearance. He could hardly be called well-dressed, though his attire was in no sense conspicuous. His movements were chiefly slow and heavy, those of a lounger, like a seal on a sandbank, as a too-candid friend had put it. In short, there was nothing to bear witness outwardly of the immense reserve fund of fiery vigor, prodigious personality, and dominant intellect which dwelt within this many-sided genius. It would never have occurred to a casual observer that this thick-set, heavy, sluggish-looking man was naturally master of every company in which he found himself, a genial despot, a king by right, a born ruler over minds in other respects on a level with his own. Hidden forces of sovereignty and of creative power smoldering deeply in Rossetti's breast could turn him at times into a volcano of enthusiasm and energy. Two other men inhabited Tudor House as subtenants, Rossetti's brother, William Michael, and Algernon Charles Swinburne, while George Meredith also lived there for a time. None, however, was what may be termed a fixture. Swinburne and Meredith had each his own separate sitting-room, and W. M. Rossetti a bedroom only. Theoretically, the party met at dinner, but Swinburne was the only one who was fairly punctual to this arrangement. As for Rossetti himself, he acted in all things according to the dictates of the moment's impulse, and took his meals at any time he chose. His household arrangements, though far from parsimonious, were thus hardly calculated to promote anything beyond comfort of a more or less off-hand kind. Today, having completed his careless toilet, he passed out into the adjoining room, which he called the breakfast room. Green leaves brushed the window pane, and sunlight filtered through them. A large colored porcelain chandelier, which had once been David Garrick's, somewhat lightened up the general effect, and from the lovely avenue of lime trees in the garden, delicious scents stole in. Rosetti, languidly eating a lukewarm meal, appeared to acquire a gradual accession of energy. He looked through his morning's letters gave the most casual of glances at the newspaper, for current events scarcely had the slightest interest for him, went down into his large studio, and presently strolled into the garden to play with the animals. The mulberries were ripening upon Queen Elizabeth's mulberry tree, the neglected garden intermingled flowers and weeds in rank luxuriance of leaf and blossom, the uncut grass lay long and withering under July rays, and the fierce flood of noontide glory beat down between the lime branches. The man of southern ancestry gazed around him with his ill-sighted eyes, hungrily drinking in every detail of luscious color. The pure, light, warm green, which of all colors he loved the best, was tangible and consummate in the lime leaves, and the deep gold color and certain tints of gray, secondarily dear to him, were conspicuous in the dappled play of light and shadow. Those other hues, which he had defined as shadowy or steel blue and brown with a crimson tinge, were present to his regard among the crowd of tangled flowers in their rich abandon of growth. 
last and most magnificent, the scarlet in which his soul rejoiced, flamed at him in the splendor of great poppies here and there, half wild and wholly magnificent. Other colors, he had announced, are only lovable according to the relation in which they are placed, and if he needed them, here they were in all the multitudes of midsummer. Almost he could imagine, in the great green boughs, some dryad vision beckoning him with slim white arms. Almost he could succumb to an illusion of some lovely lady poised among the leaves, as in his own picture, the daydream. Within the branching shade of reverie, dreams even may spring till autumn. Yet, none be like woman's budding daydream spirit fanned lo toward deep skies not deeper than her look she dreams till now on her forgotten book drops the forgotten blossom from her hand the creatures wild and tame who flew or crept or burrowed or strutted or wriggled in this strangest of all london gardens were furtively edging nearer and nearer on all sides to the man whom they recognized as a friend rossetti took up the wombat and fondled it he patted the unprepossessing wallaby he fed the ungracious raccoon he dandled and teased the fat irresponsive woodchuck Occasionally he tossed a little notice to his Pomeranian puppy, Punch, or his great Irish deerhound, Wolf. Now and then he whistled to the birds, or paid a brief attention to the kangaroo in its enclosure. But of all his beasts, he loved the wombat best. Yet time was passing all too rapidly, and Rossetti had, of late, made a definite attempt to work systematically and with a certain amount of daily output whether in painting or poetry he retraced his steps to the house and tried to settle himself to his labor everything appeared to be in a conspiracy to attract or to deflect his attention at all points of the room some object quaint or curious or unusual or perhaps with no claim to notice beyond its evident antiquity some object called aloud to him so to speak and drew him aside he had recently developed the collector's mania in its most unbridled form with plenty of money flowing in and no particular necessity involved in the spending of it he had suddenly evinced a passion for acquiring old oak, old furniture, old convex mirrors, old titles, and above all, blue china. He was one of the first men in England to start a collection of Japanese and Chinese blue china, and a very fine one his was, as might reasonably be expected from the time and cash which he expended on it although he sometimes paid in the form of a picture this desire for possession of the antique the bizarre the odd the not necessarily beautiful was perhaps one of the most remarkable anomalies in rossetti's paradoxical nature it was at most a transitory phase just now at its full swing and yet there seemed a certain incongruity in the fact that the man who combined at their highest points of perfection the crafts of the painter and the poet the man who in england was the prime force of the poetic and artistic movement of the latter nineteenth century should be ransacking dealer's shops for what henley characterized as flemmy little bits of blue and rummaging old curiosity stores after dusty oaken relics yet we know that extremes meet 
and meet with such frequency in the artistic temperament that after all one need hardly be surprised to see rossetti very much of the earth earthy gloating one moment over some grotesquely hideous chinese curio or rising another moment to superb altitudes of thought and diction whither few if any had preceded him and as he sauntered round his spacious studio or his wide sunny drawing-room and noted the various precious objects with which every nook was crammed a flash of second sight lit up his mind may not this ancient room thou sittest in dwell in separate living souls for joy or pain nay all its corners may be painted plain where heaven shows pictures of some life spent well and may be stamped a memory all in vain upon the sight of lidless eyes in hell inclusiveness and the never silent ever haunting memory returned to him which only by distractions deliberately invoked could be shut out a while the memory of his dead wife and of all that he had lost in her and of all the negligences and omissions with which rightly or wrongly he reproached himself looking back upon their brief married life of her prophetically and of himself left desolate he had written twenty years before in what was to prove one of his greatest poems when he told how the blessed damozel leaned out from the gold bar of heaven her blue grave eyes were deeper much than a deep water even she had three lilies in her hand and the stars in her hair were seven her robe ungirt from clasp to hem no wrought flowers did adorn but a white rose of mary's gift on the neck meetly worn and her hair lying down her back was yellow like ripe corn her seemed she scarce had been a day one of god's choristers the wonder was not yet quite gone from that still look of hers albeit to them she left her day had counted as ten years to one it is ten years of years yet now here in this place surely she leaned o'er me her hair fell all about my face nothing the autumn fall of leaves the whole year sets apace it was the terrace of god's house that she was standing on by god built over the sheer depth in which space is begun so high that looking downward thence she could scarce see the sun it lies from heaven across the flood of ether as a bridge beneath the tides of day and night with flame and blackness ridge the void as low as where this earth spins like a fretful midge heard hardly some of her new friends playing at holy games spake gentle-mouthed among themselves their virginal chaste names and the souls mounting up to god went by her like thin flames and still she bowed herself and stooped into the vast waste calm till her bosom's pressure must have made the bar she leaned on warm and the lilies lay as if asleep along her bended arm from the fixed lull of heaven she saw time like a pulse shake fierce through all the worlds her gaze still strove in that steep gulf to pierce the swarm and then she spake as when the stars sang in their spheres the blessed damozel 
and of her and of himself again he had written prophetically in the mystic and mysterious tale of hand and soul for she whether as maid or wife whether living or dead had given him inspiration and aspiration even such as the veiled woman who was his very soul brought to chiaro dell'ermo the painter a woman was present in his room clad to the hands and feet with a green and gray raiment fashioned to that time it seemed that the first thoughts he had ever known were given him as at first from her eyes and he knew her hair to be the golden veil through which he beheld his dreams though her hands were joined her face was not lifted but set forward and though the gaze was austere yet her mouth was supreme in gentleness she did not move closer towards him but he felt her to be as much with him as his breath he was like one who scaling a great steepness hears his own voice echoed in some place much higher than he can see and the name of which is not known to him as the woman stood her speech was with chiaro not as it were from her mouth or in his ears but distinctly between them i am an image chiaro of thine own soul within thee see me and know me as i am thou sayest that fame has failed thee and faith failed thee but because at least thou hast not laid thy life under riches therefore though thus late i am suffered to come unto thy knowledge fame sufficed not for that thou didst seek fame seek thine own conscience not thy mind's conscience but thine heart's and all shall approve and suffice while he heard chiaro went slowly on his knees it was not to her that spoke for the speech seemed within him and his own the air brooded in sunshine and though the turmoil was great outside the air within was at peace but when he looked in her eyes he wept hand and soul and now rossetti filled his eyes with gazing on his own picture of beata beatrix whose face was that of his wife the noblest accomplishment of his genius in which he had rendered into form and color the words of dante's balata because mine eyes can never have their fill of looking at my lady's lovely face i will so fix my gaze that i may become blessed beholding her of this he had declared that no picture ever cost him so much pain in painting it was the first time since her death that he had permitted himself to recall that lovely countenance and that with no picture had he ever felt so conscious of his supreme mastery in art it is not he said intended at all to represent death but to render it under the semblance of a trance in which she is suddenly rapt from earth to heaven in this glorious achievement he had entirely broken away from the style of his early medieval work more or less intentionally modeled upon the archaisms of a certain period he had foregone the meticulous detail of the pre raphaelites the stiff gestures of tuscan art the precision of crowded detail he had forsaken the quaint chambers in quaint places where angels creep in through sliding panel doors and stand behind rows of flowers drumming on golden bells with wings crimson and green 
he had shaken off some of the trammels of a conscious pose and was now using his palette and his pen coincidentally to express the best that was in him again and again he had declared that if any man has any poetry in him he should paint for it has all been said and written and they have scarcely begun to paint it moreover he frequently found himself able to demonstrate his meaning more clearly through pigment than through ink because of that all permeating color sense of his to which we have already alluded great colorists like great poets are born not made color and emotion are practically identical and if poetry be according to wordsworth's dictum emotion remembered in tranquillity the desire of rossetti to express himself through such a medium can only be regarded as an inevitable outcome of his remarkable poetic temperament i believe color he had written to be a quite indispensable quality in the highest art color is the physiognomy of a picture and cannot be perfectly beautiful without proving goodness and greatness it is another incongruity of the versatile genius of rossetti that one of his most successful pictures should be almost colorless in comparison with the rest his annunciation or ecce enchila domini as he named it is a study of purity almost unique in its dignity and restraint the white daub was his own name for this masterpiece which for very very many years found no purchaser and drew down such a nice derangement of epitaphs from the principal art critics as might have fatally discouraged a less indomitable man at the very outset of his career here again picture and poetry were at one in his thoughts for he had loved to dwell in ave and in mary's girlhood upon this neglected or forgotten subject the obscure days of the virgin before gabriel's salutation sounded in her ears this is that blessed mary pre-elect god's virgin gone is a great while and she dwelt young in nazareth of galilee unto god's will she brought devout respect profound simplicity of intellect and supreme patience from her mother's knee faithful and hopeful wise in charity strong in grave peace in pity circumspect so held she through her girlhood as it were an angel watered lily that near god grows and is quiet till one dawn at home she woke in her white bed and had no fear at all yet wept till sunshine and felt awed because the fullness of the time was come mary's girlhood some special subtle charm of chastity and sanctity drew rossetti to the contemplation of this exquisite maidenly figure in its gracious reticence by the very force of contrast she appealed to him as compared with the passionate and impassioned woman of his normal ideal the richly glowing deeply loving long-throated dense-haired full-lipped lady of so many poems and so many paintings such a one was helen of troy town such lilith of eden bower such burning with unquenchable love and hate the desperate heroine of sister helen 
why did you melt your waxen man sister helen to-day is the third since you began the time was long yet the time ran little brother o oh, mother merry mother three days to-day between hell and heaven but if you have done your work aright sister helen you'll let me play for you said i might be very still in your play to-night little brother o oh, mother merry mother third night to-night between hell and heaven o oh, the waxen knave was plump to-day sister helen how like dead folk he has dropped away nay now of the dead what can you say little brother o oh, mother merry mother what of the dead between hell and heaven see see the sunken pile of wood sister helen shines through the thinned wax red as blood nay now when looked you yet on blood little brother o oh, mother merry mother how pale she is between hell and heaven see see the wax has dropped from its place sister helen and the flames are winning up apace yet here they burn but for a space little brother o oh, mother merry mother here for a space between hell and heaven ah what white thing at the door has crossed sister helen ah what is this that sighs in the frost a soul that's lost as mine is lost little brother o oh, mother merry mother lost lost all lost between hell and heaven it was almost afternoon when rossetti sat down to write in hard earnest i shall never i suppose he had remarked get over the weakness of making a thing as good as i can manage and this man of indolent physical habits was most sedulous and fastidious in mental ones he spared himself no trouble in perfecting in revising in remodeling anything slurred or scamped or slipshod was abhorrent to him his poems were the growth of that fundamental brain work which he had stipulated as the only real origin of great poetry but these growths were tilled and tended pruned and watered by him with scrupulous and unremitting care he had his own strongly defined views on the composition of a poem it was no haphazard affair with him of casual inspiration poetry said he should seem to the hearer to have been always present to his thought but never before heard it was therefore largely from the prospective hearer's point of view that the poems were executed his italian blood and italian instincts prevented him ever looking at things from a thoroughly english point of view his mind was withdrawn from all that ordinarily occupied the mental processes of the ordinary man restricted within definite and in some sense narrow limits in politics metaphysics science theology history whether of nations or individuals he had no interest and thus the whole strength of an acute and penetrating intellect was devoted to art and poetry powerfully concentrated in a twofold effort for about an hour he remained fixed in body and spirit sometimes he hummed softly and deeply sotto voce sometimes he rocked himself to and fro sometimes with restless fidgety movement he crossed one foot over the other and shook it rapidly 
now and then he clicked his thumb and first fingernails together in a manner that would have irritated any companion but for the most part he was curiously quiet setting down carefully and with assiduous attention in his bold clear sweeping handwriting the outcome of many previous meditations rarely has there been such a conjunction of the artist and the craftsman as in his younger days rossetti had frequented the british museum to find out what he classed as stunning words for poetry reverberant stately medieval words instinct with sound and color so now he used his words as a painter his paints selecting them from an astoundingly rich vocabulary and not seldom using them in a new sense or putting them to a new service such as they had not hitherto known in customary english usage that his lines should be perfectly lucid unimpaired by any intricacy or cloudiness of expression was his first care and hence the limpid clarity and dignity of his best work the close of the staff and scrip for instance which falls upon the ear like a passage of sebastian bach stand up to-day still armed with her good night before his brow who then as now was here and there who had in mind thy vow then even as now the lists are set in heaven to-day the bright pavilions shine fair hangs thy shield and none gainsay the trumpets sound in sign that she is thine not tithed with days and years decease he pays thy wage he owed but with imperishable peace here in his own abode thy jealous god the staff and scrip or again in the sonorous majesty of a superscription look in my face my name is might have been i am also called no more too late farewell unto thine ear i hold the dead sea-shell cast up thy life's foam-fretted feet between unto thine eyes the glass where that is seen which had life's form and loves but by my spell is now a shaken shadow intolerable of ultimate things unuttered the frail screen hark me how still i am but should there dart one moment through thy soul the soft surprise of that winged peace which lulls the breath of sighs then shalt thou see me smile and turn apart thy visage to mine ambush at thy heart sleepless with cold commemorative eyes in like manner as rossetti seems to have served no apprenticeship in literature but to have come suddenly and swiftly into the possession of his full inheritance many of his first poems having been written from his eighteenth to his twenty-third year so also he was not beholden to experience to books or to anything beyond the promptings of a vivid intuition amounting almost to clairvoyance for the subject matter of his poems they are nearly all the expression of some poignant passion in which violent emotions are so to speak the dramatis personae and external nature the mere background it has been well said that no nineteenth-century english poet had so little of the instinctive love of nature as rossetti he was essentially an indoors poet not only was he a throwback a reversion 
to medieval thought in his views and cognizance of life intrinsically a man of the middle ages and thus by no means a votary of wild nature but he did not care for the outdoor world at all he objected to traveling it was too disturbing and perturbing he disliked walking it was too much trouble and although he observed and mentally noted a hundred intimate details of nature and of scenery it was the painter's eye rather than the poet's heart which was attracted by them living as he did shut up mainly within his own four walls rising late and accessible to but few visitors a curious prestige of mystery and seclusion surrounding him which rendered him an unknown quantity to the world at large rossetti had but a small store of experiences to draw upon when compared with other english poets of his age nor did his double-sided art provide him with more for the pre raphaelite brotherhood had kept themselves to themselves presenting to the bewilderment or amusement of the world at large a front of jealously guarded privacy it therefore renders his work more marvelous in its result that it should have been practically the outcome of instinct and insight only a rich and obscure glow of insight to quote coventry patmore into depths too profound and too sacred for clear speech even if they could be spoken and the most remarkable point of all is the fact that rossetti's friends and contemporaries regarded his poems and his paintings as only a faint expression of an inner force thus his art which has been defined as the climax of personality was held by all who knew him to be so much inferior to the possibilities of that personality that it afforded but the vaguest suggestion of what he might do if he should choose to exert his full powers the medium in which he worked whether words or colors was a hindrance rather than a help to him rossetti laid down his pen at last and involuntarily turned as though to read his completed poem aloud to some sympathetic listener then with a gesture of despair he brushed away this vain delusion and recognized that he was very much alone by no means a man of naturally morbid nature he was so encompassed by vivid and melancholy memories that when unsuccored by the society of friends a certain somberness of gloom invested him again in recollection his lips were touching the lovely lips of his wife that should never smile upon him more again he meditated in the very terms of dante's sorrow which he had pictured and translated so touchingly then my heart that was so full of love said unto me it is true that our lady lieth dead and it seemed to me that i went to look upon the body wherein that blessed and most noble spirit had had its abiding place and so strong was this idle imagining that it made me to behold my lady in death whose head certain ladies seemed to be covering with a white veil and who was so humble of her aspect that it was as though she had said i have attained to look on the beginning of peace vita nuova of dante alighieri and his mind always prone to the supernatural if not to the superstitious 
pondered with renewed longing whether it might not yet be possible to hold intercourse with the world beyond the grave over and over again he had made the sanguine attempt by means of spiritualistic phenomena over and over again he had been disappointed yet still he cherished a futile fatalistic hope of some clearer and nearer communion with the dead he was not in the ordinary sense of the words a religious man or rather his religion was medieval in its main characteristics a deep and sincere reverence for the person of christ a boundless admiration for the book of ecclesiastes an acquaintance with the more humanly emotional chapters of the gospels these were the chief essentials of his faith yet though his beliefs were of this heterogeneous character a fortuitous concourse of atoms rossetti was capable of being most indignant at any hint that he was irreligious or unchristian do not my works testify to my christianity he had vehemently inquired it was a question impossible to answer but this spasm of heartache and longing which had momentarily oppressed him was largely the result of mental exhaustion writing poetry took it out of rossetti to quite an abnormal extent he described himself as the racked and tortured medium never permitted an instant's surcease of agony until the thing on hand is finished and now to banish painful thoughts and find a restorative the artist took up a book and immersed himself a while in its pages rossetti was not a great or omnivorous reader he was a leisurely and fastidious one the library contained about a thousand volumes some being rare and curious books above all english imaginative writers he worshipped shakespeare coleridge and shelley among novelists his chief admiration was dumas boswell's johnson was his favorite reading at night when he lay sleepless but probably the book which had more influenced his own work than any other was the immortal mort d'arthur of mallory he was very sensitive towards fine poetry it affected him even to tears but certain writers he had hardly even patience to hear mentioned upon this index expurgatorius figured the names of thackeray balzac and george eliot it will therefore be seen that rossetti's tastes in literature were like all his other tastes of a most resolutely personal order the afternoon was rapidly drawing to a close not much had been accomplished sloth alas said rossetti to himself has but too much to answer for with me i had better stick to knowing how to mix vermilion and ultramarine for a flesh gray and how to manage their equivalents in verse he quoted under his breath with melancholy meaning his own tremendous lines lost days the lost days of my life until to-day what were they could i see them in the street lie as they fell would they be ears of wheat sown once for food but trodden into clay or golden coin squandered and still to pay or drops of blood dabbling the guilty feet or such spilt water as in dreams must cheat the undying throats of hell a thirst away i do not see them here but after death god knows i know the faces i shall see each one a murdered self with low last breath i am thyself 
what hast thou done to me and i and i thyself lo each one saith and thou thyself to all eternity and as he betook himself to his easel with a valiant determination to toil till daylight failed him voices and footsteps broke cheerfully upon his ear and some of his chosen intimates appeared in the doorway swinburne walter pater edward burne jones one by one came dropping in arthur o'shaughnessy edmund goss philip burke marston the young blind poet were numbered amongst rossetti's most loyal admirers so were william morris william bell scott and last not least ford maddox brown his quondam master and consistently faithful friend rossetti received his friends with that bluff hearty free and easy geniality which was one of his chief attributes and the studio soon resounded with laughter for this paradoxical poet was a man of infinite jest his rich voice rang out a thousand changes of intonation from the most despotic assertions the most autocratic layings down of the law to the sparkle and scintillation of a spontaneous mirth and humor in which few could rival him and with all this he executed a tremendous influence apparently unknown to himself over every one with whom he came in contact absolutely careless and indifferent as to the effect he produced unimpressive in appearance entirely unaffected in manner without a trace of pose or pedestal he ruled with a complete and enthralling dominance over whatever circle surrounded him the extraordinary homage which his admirers rendered him in no wise went to his head he was too commanding a personality to be dazzled or dizzied by applause meanwhile he painted busily as long as light was available he never relaxed work until darkness drove him to surrender then whatever hour it might be with his usual disregard of times and seasons he ordained to dine and lounged into the little green dining-room where swinburne and meredith might or might not join him for truth to tell the poet's happy-go-lucky methods of life were not always conducive to comfort that he was inconsiderate on minor points however affectionate and generous on greater matters no one could contradict the twilight was already deepening into dusk and the garden a mere well of shadows when rossetti sauntered out again and heard how his animals of nocturnal habits scuttered and grunted and snuffled in the tangled grasses a faint sweetness of lilies blended with the celestial odor of the lime blossom and warm aromatic scents of herbage lingered through the darkness in such a night among the nebulous half-lights and fragrance his astarte syriaca might have taken concrete form moving in sea-green robes through the grave green of midsummer while the low wind in the treetops made a sound like a distant sea mystery lo betwixt the sun and moon astarte of the syrians venus queen ere aphrodite was in silver sheen her twofold girdle clasps the infinite boon of bliss whereof the heaven and earth commune and from her neck's inclining flower stem lean love freighted lips and absolute eyes that wean the pulse of hearts 
to the sphere's dominant tune torch bearing her sweet ministers compel all thrones of light beyond the sky and sea the witnesses of beauty's face to be that face of love's all penetrative spell amulet talisman and oracle betwixt the sun and moon a mystery astarte syriaca rossetti debated with himself whether to take one of his accustomed walks which were only pursued at night he could not decide whether it were not too late to go as far as albany street to visit his mother that intellectual and noble woman whom he loved with so tender a devotion he went out to the front of the house and stood looking down upon the river in those days the foreshore boasted no embankment but was bestrewn with boats and the various litter and debris of the waterside the river gleamed seductively beneath the rising moon but the night was sultrier than ever to cover miles of oven-like streets was a most repugnant idea rossetti shrugged his shoulders and turned back a sudden insufferable weariness and languor descended upon him and the weariness as usual was companioned by the remembrance of a woman's face a face of unworldly simplicity and purity of aspect with blue-green eyes brilliant complexion and a heavy crown of copper golden hair a face in short of extraordinary beauty not to be equaled not to be forgotten a long long while he sat in his lonely studio summoning this exquisite countenance from the vistas of the past striving with vain strenuous endeavor to materialize it before his eyes but this consummation continuously evaded him nothing short of the eternal futurity could restore his wife into his arms again even so where heaven holds breath and hears the beating heart of love's own breast where round the secret of all spheres all angels lay their wings to rest how shall my soul stand rapt and awed when by the new birth born abroad throughout the music of the suns it enters in her soul at once and knows the silence there for god here with her face doth memory sit meanwhile and wait the day's decline till other eyes shall look from it eyes of the spirit's palestine even than the old gaze tenderer while hopes and aims long lost with her stand round her image side by side like tombs of pilgrims that have died about the holy sepulchre the portrait it was far into the small hours of the morning the twilight had shifted round northward and was merging itself into the dawn of a new day when dante gabriel rossetti dragged himself upstairs to that heavily darkened room where sleep could rarely be induced to enter for four years he had suffered from insomnia the one enemy of all others with which he was least fitted to cope impatient impetuous self-willed he had seized the nearest weapon to hand the most powerful soporific then available which at that time was so little known that its possible ill results were only a remote contingency chloral afforded him an unconsciousness which would hardly be termed repose he lighted a candle which would burn for the rest of the night put a book upon the couch to which he would transfer himself when weary of tossing on a restless bed 
swallowed his customary dose, and lay down to await what peace the night might bring him. Peace, so long a stranger to his troubled spirit and feverishly laborious brain. And while his eyes at last closed, as under a leaden weight, beneath the benumbing influence of the narcotic, his thoughts ran slowly and in broken phrasing upon the lines which he believed his best and highest achievement and in which his ultimate longings were voiced as by a muffled music. When vain desire at last and vain regret go hand in hand to death and all is vain, what shall assuage the unforgotten pain and teach the unforgetful to forget? Shall peace be still a sunk stream long unmet or may the soul at once in a green plain stoop through the spray of some sweet life fountain and cull the dew-drenched flowering amulet ah when the wan soul in that golden air between the scriptured petals softly blown peers breathless for the gift of grace unknown ah let none other alien spell so e'er but only the one hope's one name be there not less nor more but even that word alone the one hope end of chapter seven a day with rossetti Recording by Lucretia B.